welcome to the 10th episode of season 3 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 22nd of June 2010 and in this episode we're going to hear the last two interviews from the recent Ubuntu uh, Developers Summit. We'll catch up with all the news we've missed over the last few weeks. Uh, we'll do the bit about Ubuntu, uh, go your feedback. Uh, anything else? No, nope, that's it. it. Oh, great. Right, I'm Simon and with me this evening it's a bit of a hmm, an interesting show today. We're Al Fresco. <laughs> Al Fresco sat in Popey's back garden. It's yes. a trellis. Uh, I think there's actually a proper name for that, and it's not Trellis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Luckily, my wife's not here to berate you for you giving it the wrong name. Does she listen to the show? She might do. <laughs> okay. Sorry, are we, are we on iTunes? <laughs> <laughs> it's a gazebo? No, gazebo's got walls. That's, That's the one. Pergola. Pergola. That's the one. There we yeah. go. It's very nice anyway. Yeah, thanks. So, come on, Alan. What have you been up to since... Wow. What, six weeks ago? UDS was so long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It and moved so camp, fast. camp before that. that. Yeah. And Odd Camp. It's the Crikey. first proper show we've done since before Odd Camp. Yeah. I say proper show. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Not these pretend ones that you yeah. and Laura put out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so what's new in your life? <laughs> uh, well. Um, Apart uh, from fruit. Yeah, not much, actually. It's been much the same as usual. You know, have you started playing with Maverick yet? Um, I've tried it once with uh, Test Drive, but um, that was a week or so ago. I've not tried it in anger. Um, one of the, one of the <laughs> wait till you try it. <laughs> yeah, then uh, then I will be quite cross. Um, but I've one of the news things we've got coming up about um, Dell the Unity interface. I've not actually tried any of the really cool new stuff yet. Um, I'm kind of in a bit limbo because I bought a new laptop and it doesn't run Ubuntu. It's not a laptop, oh, is it? it Oh, yeah, is that this one here? That's this that one. one here. It's yes. very thin. It's quite nice. It's lovely hardware, but it, um, it's there's got a bug. An illuminated <laughs> logo it's, on it. It's that a is fruit a big bug. Yes, it's a fruit-based fruit based based laptop. <laughs> fruit-based laptop. Um, but unfortunately, there's a kernel bug that's well well known now mm. by the kernel team and upstream kernel. Mm. But unfortunately, it can't see the hard drive. So if you put an Ubuntu CD, in, hey, that was a good buy. That was an well, excellent actually, purchase. it was a canonical yeah. employee who suggested I should buy one of these, and his words were, you'll have no problem with it. <laughs> and you know exactly who that person is, and he knows who that is. <laughs> Don't you, schwuck. <laughs> <laughs> or, or was he implying that you'd have no problem with the interface because it's identical? To <laughs> well, yeah, because the buttons are on the top yeah. left, <laughs> and the log on screen's the same. We've said all this before, uh, yes. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just recapping for people who might have missed or forgotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So, Tony, what have you been up to? Uh, Techie-wise, I installed Easy Peasy 1.6 on... You're always my, doing yeah. that. You were talking about that at Ogcamp. They, they released... Uh, that was... Yeah, they, they released the upgrade after Ogcamp. So oh. I, I installed that. Uh, they released a version a year ago, so I'm not like, always doing it. <laughs> Cutting edge. Yeah, had a, <laughs> just, well, it's, it's, it's just that the last well, time I spoke to you, you were doing it, <laughs> which was six weeks ago. Six weeks ago. Um, they have... Uh, basically, it's based on Lucid, so it's... Um, uh, quite a lot of changes have gone into that and the interface is all very shiny and nice my 3G dongle just works which is pretty good going because it didn't work under the old version I had a bit of uh, palaver about the uh, encrypted home which the settings were you already encrypted I had already then? encrypted home and I had all the, the fail safe right. numbers written down and all that sort of stuff so I could get it back but there was a bit of a bit of a bug where it didn't you know, automatically set it all up that's a bit of a worry actually because I don't think people realise that, that there's the possibility when you upgrade that you, you know, if you lose some critical mm. piece of data, you might not be able to access your encrypted data. The, the, the problem was they had moved the location of the files, the metadata about your encrypted directories from somewhere in etc. to to somewhere in Var slash or home. Oh. oh, was it? So, so all that data is now held in home on the principle that people sometimes have a separate home partition and wipe the rest of their drive, which is what I had did that I had done. But I ha- had done it before I had realised that I needed to keep some of the metadata. Were there release notes that you didn't read? (laughs) There weren't any release notes on the Easy Peasy site, but there may have been Ubuntu release notes Ah, that I didn't read. Um, But I I knew I had the code, so it was just a case of sweating and swearing over it until it worked, which is fine. (laughs) Actually, I have... uh, You know that prompt that comes up when you use EcryptFS? There's a prompt that says you should write down this code just in case you ever need you. Hmm. I've actually got a little piece of paper with all of them written down of all my machines. Excellent. Wow. Uh, And it's not anywhere I'm going to tell you. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. What about you, Simon? Um, well, I've got some uh, goodness in my life. I've finally got an Android phone. Ah, which one? Um, it's the Desire. Just HTC as we're all Desire. moving off Android. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't moved on it yet. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. Love it. Very good. Um, so that's what, the... Uh, what fun. apps have you got then? What are the killer oh, All apps? sorts of stuff. Nah. What's the big thing about it? Why? why what, what For you? Because you've come from a Windows mobile phone, haven't you? It does what I want. There's no real restrictions. Loads of apps. They're all, well, not all, lots of free apps that 
do just what I'm after. How many have you bought? How many paid apps? None. Really? Yeah. That's not good for the Android platform, really, is it? You're not going to attract developers not, to a platform where nobody buys. I'm not talking about the business buys. case. I'm talking about the software and the. No, but for you in the long term, if if you're going to if if you want to buy a plat, uh, a device that's going to be successful in the long term, you want developers writing software for it. Don't you? Does, sure, it? but there's loads of apps, but you don't have to pay for them. Is that yeah, not like free software? Yeah, uh, I've got one which, in fact, you turned me on to, <laughs> which was um, one yeah. which you showed me, which is. Wi-Fi the, analyzer? Uh, no, 3G Watchdog. That's the one. That's really Fantastic yeah. piece of software. Free, but I've um, sent him some money because it's awesome. Uh, now, it's funny you should say that. I, I, yeah, I sent someone some money for some free software. I bought, uh, I bought an Amazon Kindle and I used Calibra, the oh, e-book yes. reader. Yeah. And I sent them some money. And that was quite, quite good. Right. And actually, I was at work and one of the girls at work has got an e-book reader. And she, I said, oh, I use this Calibra. And she went, oh, yeah, yeah, I use that as well. I said, oh, it's quite good. I sent him a donation. And she went, yeah, yeah, I did too. Fantastic. Yeah, that's actually more common than I thought. That's no, good. People, I, you know, I yeah. used, to, I well, have done over the last few years, made a kind of Christmas donation to uh, one or two free software projects that I've used heavily in the last year as yeah. kind of bit to share the goodwill, you know, spread mm. the Christmas cheer. Yeah. Talking of which, I joined the EFF. Oh, yes. Yeah. The EF, EFF. EFF. Electronic. Not the FSFE. No. Um, I may do that. Oh, okay. But um, you know, just the same as the uh, OIG donation, five quid a month. Yeah, yeah, because it's important. Uh, and they're sort of the US based. Yeah, but the they, OIG in a way. Sort of kind of getting into um, sort of worldwide stuff, not just uh, right. US based stuff like Actor and all that. Yeah, yeah and yeah. the only other thing of note, and you'll love this. I was getting ready for my joggler. I got the joggler turned mm-hmm. up, and uh, <laughs> trashed the boot record of my laptop building. The USB stick. Excellent. DD to the <laughs> wrong place, did you? Well, no, I did it all uh, correctly. Um, I booted the uh, booted my laptop up into the Netbook Remix, put the USB stick in, installed onto the USB stick, and then it basically wanted to. When I next booted my laptop, it went where the hell the USB stick had gone. Yeah. Oh, grub. Yeah. Monkeyed around with so I'd uh, trash grub. So it was a couple of hours of uh, sweating. Uh, hey, it, it'd be boring otherwise, wouldn't it? <laughs> Well, we've got no Dave today because we're recording out of cycle a bit and no Laura because she's doing her hair. It's a girl thing. It is a girl thing. Um, so we've got the two interviews coming up from UDS. So we're going to start with the first one, which I think is uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Humphrey. Humphrey. Yeah. So this is Dave and Alan here at UDS with Benjamin Humphrey, who seems to have got the award for travelling the furthest distance to get here. Where have you come from? New Zealand. And uh, what brings you to UDS? Uh, what brings me to the UDS? Well, probably the Ubuntu Manual project the most. So the, the project that we started about four or five months ago. Um, and so that's just basically creating content to further increase Ubuntu's support and documentation and help system. And for Maverick, we're going to be working on the infrastructure for that. So that's why I'm here. And the manual that you created was scheduled to come out in time with the uh, the release of Lucid. Did you hit the target? Did you get your manual out on time? Absolutely. We released it like 24 hours before Lucid and in the first 24 hours we got 20,000 downloads which we were pretty impressed with. So um, Since then, I think it's been what, two weeks since since Lucid came out and I think we've got about 100,000 downloads of it. Uh, Have you had much feedback, bug reports, you know, any kind of detail um, from readers? Well, we've had a few sort of small blog posts and a lot of comments on articles and stuff that were announcing it but overall uh, all feedback especially at UDS I've had a lot of people come up to me and be like yeah this is rocking and uh, and there's been like four sessions uh, where people want to make manuals so it's like now there's a Rick Spencer and I had a session which was like a developer's manual there's like a packaging manual a loco team manual the translation teams want to make like a short pdf guide to how to get started with translations so it's obviously kicked off a lot of excitement for the books <laughs> So for those that haven't come across the Ubuntu Manual project, uh, how does that differ from the Ubuntu doc and the du- Ubuntu documentation that's already there? So the manual at the moment is a like a 167-page linear consistent documentation with screenshots available in a whole bunch of different languages. So for the Ubuntu documentation that's on the wiki and that it's not very consistent, it doesn't have many screenshots, and the wiki stuff isn't actually translated. And uh, the, the stuff on help at Ubuntu.com is actually translated, but uh, the docs team encouraged the loco teams to actually do their own translations of it, so it's spread out all over the internet. And so what we do is, is reword it 
make it nicer, put it into a linear format, and we uh, improve the consistency and the quality, have it, make sure it's all up to date for each release, and uh, have it all translated, including the screenshots. So do you work, I mean, when you say it's linear, does, so does that mean it's something for you to work through, like page one, this is how you install it, and this is then moving on, how you open certain applications after you install? Is that what you mean by that? Yes, so it's basically you go from you've heard about Ubuntu from your friend and your friend gives you the manual and the first chapter is a, a, like a prologue which gives you an introduction about uh, Ubuntu and the history and the philosophy of Ubuntu and then it goes covers installation and then it covers around your desktop and the default applications so it slowly builds you up. Uh, we try to have a very, very shallow learning curve so people who, even, even people who haven't used computers much before will be able to learn the fundamentals of computers as well. And you mentioned screenshots and uh, the fact that it's translated into multiple languages. That's got to be quite a lot of work to generate a bazillion screenshots in lots of languages. How do you, how do you manage that process? So we, um, we actually created another application, which was a fairly crazy task. So I had this idea that um, to get a whole bunch of screenshots, we, obviously the screenshots that we're taking need to be in the same resolution and they need to be the same theme and they need to ha- have a default theme. They need to um, obviously be the correct screenshots for what we want to, to, to convey. So we chose about 50 screenshots. Um, so the authors for each chapter would sort of nominate bits of the user interface that they would like screenshots for. And uh, we created an application called QuickShot, which is written in Python, and uh, we use Quickly, actually. <laughs> so, um, so QuickShot, basically, you install it, and um, it's very easy to install. You can also run it off a QuickShot live CD, it has all the language packs on the live CD. And um, it, what it does is it changes your language for you. It creates a new QuickShot user with the default theme, changes the resolution automatically. When you select a screen, pulls a list of screenshots from our server. When you select the screenshot you want to take, it, um, it opens that application, runs the application, and then it instructs you to open up a particular dialog or something like that. It takes the screenshot at the correct X and Y coordinates of the application. So all applications are full screen. And, um, and for the case of like the wireless network dialog box, we take the particular X and Y coordinates, uh, crops it, and then sends it through to the server. Uh, we'll use BZR as a back end and all that sort of stuff. So, so you've got a whole process for creating them, and you've got um, an application that helps you do that, and you've got a group of p- people who are keen to do that. How are you affected when little things like the buttons move or other U- UI elements change as they do in the cycle? Um, so, yeah, so we had like a few hundred. So overall, we need about 3,000 screenshots across all the languages. So we had a few hundred of them done, and then the buttons moved. They actually, they're already on the left. We knew that, but they moved. They just changed the order. And so we had all those screenshots of the close button on the inside, and then all of a sudden the order went back to how it is now with the close button on the outside. And a um, guy on our team came up with a really cool idea to just run a script that patches all of the screenshots. So because we know the X and Y coordinates of the buttons, we just took the correct button and like basically copied and pasted it over the top of the current buttons, and it just works seamlessly because it's pixel perfect. Wow. So, yeah, that's impressive stuff. So you've got the manual that's out there, and obviously you've got plans for doing more stuff for future releases. Um, what other sessions have you been in? What, which uh, are the key sessions you've been in here at UDS? Uh, so one of the things we want to work on with Maverick is the collaboration with the docs team and the learning team. And the learning project with Martin Owens and Elizabeth Krumbach. Um, they're really keen to work with us to develop a workflow and really really sort out the key goals for all of the three, each of the three projects. So we had a really excellent session, um, was it yesterday or the day before, uh, which was the docs learning team and the manual team collaboration, right? And so, so basically, we uh, we had this excellent session and um, we sorted out this awesome roadmap for Maverick where we're all going to partake and we're going to have the same format for all of the documentation. And the translators were there as well, and they were like, "Yeah, come on, let's do that." So, uh, in terms of Maverick for collaboration, it's going to be excellent. And you're involved in some of the design team uh, sessions as well. What kind of cool and interesting stuff was going on there? So I attended um, a few design team sessions. Uh, one of the, the most interesting ones for me was the first use, uh, the first use scenario session, which was looking at developing better ways for when a user boots up their computer for the first time and never used Ubuntu before. They um, are presented with something that helps them get used to the new features of the user interface that they're not used to, like the software center that's a new concept for them. 
So, so would that be like a, a video or a slideshow or how is that going to manifest itself? So I think in the session we talked about perhaps a video or a slideshow interactive wizard or perhaps improving the installation slideshow. Um, and Ivanka came up to me the other day and, and said uh, that you and me are going to work on that for Maverick. So that was really cool. So it's a definitely a good example of a design team working with the community as well, which is what we want to see. So in regards to the, um, to the Ubuntu manual, uh, how can people actually get involved with that? I mean, so how can you get new contributors? So we uh, actively advertise a lot for new contributors all over the place. We have Facebook and Twitter accounts and that. And when they, when they come to us from these different areas of the Ubuntu community, we uh, have a, our own website which is available in multiple languages. So even if they looking to translate or if they're like our web developers from the Middle East and he doesn't speak much English but he's a fantastic web developer so if he was coming to our project for the first time he would um, come to a website which is available in his own language and there's a whole set of instructions depending on what you want to do so instead of telling them to come to IRC and say what you like we have you know are you a designer are you a developer are you an author are you an editor and you click on the button and it takes you to um it takes you to a page with step-by-step simple instructions for people to get started. Okay, and uh, where can people actually find out more about that? What's your website? So the website's just www.ubuntu-manual.org. Fantastic. Thanks for talking to us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. There's been a lot of going on while we've been away um, because we haven't done any news for a month or so have yeah we? it's been a long time so let's tuck into the news VLC 1.1.0 supports HD video decoding via the GPU and many other improvements yes yeah, just out here. today excellent not even tried it just saw the link and thought hey that sounds cool explain what HD video decoding via the GPU means so you've got a CPU which is yeah. running the software and then you've got the GPU which is the graphics card which usually does the the graphics. graphics rendering <laughs> stuff of the 3D and all the malarkey that goes on on your screen and you can offload stuff to the GPU and one of the things you can offload is video decoding so if I've got an NVIDIA card with the VDEPAL or VDEPAL I don't know which, which specific cards it supports okay. I think there are some standards around that like VDPAU and, and that kind of stuff but um, yeah it looks good and in other uh, parts of their um, in, uh, update it says uh, improve performance anyway even if you don't have that so <laughs> sounds good sounds good a little bit of FUD. Business Insider reports today on the impending collapse of uh, Microsoft with Linux, Unix and web-based systems eating Microsoft market share and mind share. Does this spell the beginning of the end of the software giant? <laughs> yeah. Probably I'm sure not. they've spent all of their money and haven't got any of it left. <laughs> well, you know, they've got multiple platforms. They've got what Windows 7 Phone Series, Phone Series 7 thing, or whatever it's called. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Windows 7 for the desktop. And they've got the Office applications. They've got yeah. Xbox. Uh, now they've got. Um, you think they're spreading themselves too soon? Thin. Well, uh, they do really well with Windows and Office, and they have done historically. Yeah. But they're really not doing that well with their phone platform, especially not the newer ones. Uh, there's a quick graph on this on this website that says that most of the revenue is coming from Office, from server, and from the Windows operating system on the desktop. Online services is a tiny little fraction. In fact, online services is losing the money. Mm. And the entertainment and devices and stuff is breaking even just barely. It's, 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 it's an interesting. It article. is because I mean, obviously the OS is shipped, so they're not. Are they no, actually they're doing anything to? <laughs> <laughs> are they actually doing anything to you know, advertise and sell their operating system? Because well, you get it. Need to. Well, yeah, that's exactly. Well, they my do. Point, they advertise Windows Seven on. I've seen adverts on I the TV. Yeah, and, you know, oh, seven TV. things about Windows 7. If you want my to hide TV your goes nefarious off internet connectivity from your wife, here's how to do it in seven seconds. Isn't, in private isn't that more trying to get people to go from XP to Windows 7? Because yeah. everyone's on XP. Go mind you, yeah. mind you, guy next to me at work bought a, a, a netbook and he turned it on this morning and, oh my God, it's so slow. <laughs> Windows 7 <laughs> Starter Edition. Wow. Yeah. Painful. Absolutely painful to start up. The compiler at home Linux distribution Gentoo ran a compromised version of an IRC server for seven months, leading to further discussion about the security of open source packages. Yes, I think the mirror 
was compromised and nobody noticed for I thought it was months. upstream. I thought yeah. it was uh, the upstream, not their package. Not their, their package as such, but they, they didn't notice and obviously it incorporated it into their their distribution for seven months. And so. then uh, I've, seen, I've seen comments online from people saying, well, Ubuntu we could have had it and Debra, uh, yeah. we didn't even actually have the package. <laughs> well, no, but it could have been another package. The, the point was, you know, unless you're verifying the PGP signatures or whatever on every upstream tarball that you download, once it gets into Ubuntu, yes, it's all, you know, the authentication's there and it's checked and, you know, whatever. But So did the MD, is it MD5's signatures I don't on the server get changed as well because I mean that's something that they, they could have they could have done it quite easily if you compromise the server enough to stick a file on it you could update the MD5 some but what they could what they shouldn't be able to do is, is change the signature on the file if mm. it's G, GPG signed that's just surely just simple security on the server yeah yeah but the problem is there's so many um, upstream projects in our distribution yep. and they all have their own uh, systems. Some of them use Git. Some of them use Bazaar. Some of them have it hosted on SourceForge or you know wherever some random web server. Mm-hmm. And they all look after their own security. I'm not advocating that we put them all in Launchpad. <laughs> <laughs> all upstreams yes. should yes. go in Launchpad. Oh, dear. Hmm, actually, <laughs> that might solve a few problems. But when I, when I ran Core Linux, I used to, to, have to try and find the original tarballs for some of the very basic system tools, and it's so hard to find. Like the original source code for Telnet. It's on some web server or some mirror or whatever, and you have no idea really what's going yeah. on or how well maintained it I is. I did exactly the same thing, and I went. I, to, I signed up for the subscription on Freshmeat.net of all these packages so that I could get updated when they were going to... And then I kind of regretted that when I got a bazillion <laughs> emails from Freshmeat whenever <laughs> things were updated. But yeah, it's a good exercise, that call. Mm. Not content with dominating the desktop, Google are after the terminal too. Thanks to a new command line tool called um, Google, you can now upload uh, pictures to Picasa, videos to YouTube, and blog posts to Blogger. What, directly from the command line? From the command line. How cool is that? And there's there's more of their services are supported as well, like Google Calendar and uh, Search as well. It's very cool. Gmail? Yeah. You can access Gmail from the command line? Yeah, I think you can, yeah. I mean, you can do it already. Yeah, but... And there's a use case thing, which is... Why? Well, if I've got uh, some video on a machine, yep, on a remote machine, on a remote machine, I want to upload it. Yeah. You know, someone sent me some video files, or they're on a server somewhere, and I want to get them up rather than download them to my desktop yeah. and then upload them again. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. It just gives the ability to do so many cool little things. Um, a script that when something happens, you can send you an email, you email yourself, or. That's already pretty easy without the without Google, really. But the fact is you can now use Google. So many people use Google. Um, take a snapshot and then upload it. Snapshot your back garden and upload it to your Picasso account. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's cool. And it's not you know, really difficult scripty stuff. This is really, really simple. Well, they've done the, they've done the heavy lifting for you yeah. by creating that tool and presumably it, you know, all the APIs and whatever are in there. It's all a bunch of Python scripts, apparently. Fancy that. And you're going to love this. Skype announces a developer API to enable software and hardware makers to tie into the almost ubiquitous <laughs> proprietary voice over IP system. A Skype Git limited access beta program starts on the 23rd of June and we'll have a link in the show notes. But so what? Well, you, yeah. do you remember how there was an ubiquitous announcement? on Alan's computers, but not ubiquitous on mine or on your side? <laughs> uh, I don't have Skype. No. Well, okay. So some I'm people want to use Skype. Sips for. Some people want to use other proprietary things like Gmail. Yep. And we provide mm-hmm. a client to Gmail in the f- in the form of a web browser. Mm-hmm. It would be nice if we could provide our own integrated client to um, Skype in the yeah. same way that we have a client to Yahoo and MSN, which are both proprietary. Yeah, it's no Facebook different. Chat, yeah, it's no different at all. Yeah. So we can have an empathy plugin for Skype. That would be cool. I'm all, I'm it has to come. Yeah, so you could chat and then click call someone, mm-hmm. and then you won't have to ever see the Skype client. You won't have to worry about all the issues with Pulse Audio and 32-bit, 64-bit bleh, that you used to get with Skype, because we'll control the client, in theory. Sweet. Adobe announces Flash 64-bit to be dead for now, but like a bad-smelling zombie, it will almost certainly return. HTML5 will smash it to death, so we'll never see it come back. Will it really? No. Mm. Quote, we remain committed to delivering 64-bit support in a future release of Flash Player, unquote. Yeah, it's quite funny because there's a link that says discuss this in the forums and you go to the forums and there's a thing that says do not discuss 64-bit Flash in the forums. (laughs) (laughs) It never existed. Don't talk about it. 
You are not a number. Yes, it's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Barcamp Blackpool is a free unconference on the 3rd of July this year at, at uh, Blackpool Pleasure Beach Casino. Last year they had crowdsourced web development sessions, geocaching and Android application development. You should go, Simon, and develop an Android application for your Android phone. Yeah, have you got the SDK mm, yet? Yes. <laughs> Don't look at yeah, me like that. you going to say that. <laughs> have you written your Hello World yet? No. Anyway, I'm sure the Barcamp is great. Apparently it was really good last year, so find out more at barcampblackpool.com. There's another bar camp coming up, Os Bar Camp, at uh, UCD Dublin on the 25th to the 26th of September. Wow, that's a long time away. Yeah, it's good to plan ahead. We're it all is. going, are we? Oh, no, you're not going. I'm I, also completely out know. of sequence with the other events. Oh, that are on. it was another bar camp. Oh, okay. Thematically linked. Oh, I see. Rewinding a bit, <laughs> there's Europython on July 19th to the 24th at Birmingham in the UK. You can find out more at europython.eu. And smack bang on top of that is OrgCon, the first open rights group conference, which is on the 24th of July as well, at City University in London. Um, James Boyle, Corey Doctorow, and Tom Watson, the MP who was very uh, big against the uh, Digital Economy Bill, um, well, the Digital Economy Act as it now is. Um, unfortunately, I can't go because I'd really love to go to this event. I've got a commitment on that day. Oh, um, cancel it. Come I, on, where's your commitment? Cancel it. I would. Uh, I suggest if you're interested in open rights, go along and have a look. Yeah, you can. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. You can book tickets, and they're not free. You have to pay, but um, it's a different um, amount whether you're an existing yeah. ORG contributor or not. It's not hugely expensive. <laughs> no, it's, no. it's ten pound or something, isn't it? We got our last interview from UDS. And that's with the Zeitgeist developer, Safe Lotfi, who I managed to mispronounce about eight times, and so did he. <laughs> so look out for that in the interview. Uh, we're here at uh, UDS at the final day. Everyone's winding down, having a few beers and relaxing. I'm here with Safe Lotfi, who's responsible for Zeitgeist. Um, what uh, inspired you to create Zeitgeist? It was actually a set of things going on simultaneously. I used to work on a project called Gimme Mayana that displayed recently used documents in a better in a more organized way. I worked for the Fraunhofer Institute that were storing uh, inf- like storing events or how people use their documents but in a research way very yeah very um, prototype theoretical theoretical yeah and yeah I got laid off and then Federico Mena from Gnome came out with this journal idea so I decided to take everything I know and put it together. And thus, the Zeit- GNOME Zeitgeist back then started, which was the user interface and the engine. And sometime later, we split the user interface and the engine and became Zeitgeist as a project, the engine itself, and several interfaces, etc. What's the concept behind for for people who've never seen Zeitgeist before? Uh, what's the concept behind it, and how does it relate to the kind of desktop people will be used to? Um... Well, you could compare... Basically, the computer is something... Or the, your computer is a companion to all your activities on yeah, on it, on the desktop. However, it has no memory of what you've ever done precisely. So, Zeitgeist represents an episodic memory in a way that we actually store every activity you do. When you start an activity, when you close it automatically without the user having to tell the computer, okay, I'm, I'm start, I'm, this is an activity we try to do things automatically. What do you define as an activity? Opening a document, reading a document, editing a document. Okay, so an activity might be I, I need to maintain my shopping list or, or something like that or um, edit my CV. Yeah. Uh, how, how does it help to have that tracked in this way in Zeitgeist? So one of the things we can tell you is uh, when you have this set of information or data stream, you can start using statistics. Basically, I can tell you, yeah, when you, you're between 8 and 10, you're usually working. You're usually not working, so you're watching YouTube, Facebook. I can populate the menus differently. So it's a, short, it's a quick access way to, to do stuff. Other things would be I adapt the menus to your habits. So the more you use an application, the more it goes up in the menu, so you have a quicker access to it. And the less you use it, the more it goes down. And... 
Is this something that someone could, uh, is it all packaged up and something someone could install on their yes. standard desktop? We have a PPA and you don't even have to install it. It runs uninstalled. You can just run a script. And what's it written in? Python. <laughs> the whole thing is written in Python. I don't know why both of us laughed then when you said Python. Because no one believes me. <laughs> and what are the future plans for it? Have you got a, a roadmap for Zeitgeist? Well, we have, we're a big team right now. We are more or less seven developers working on several aspects of Zeitgeist, API, internal engine, etc. It grew a lot during the, between the UD, UD, two UDS. The first UDS were only two developers. Now we're eight, seven to eight developers. Um, we are trying to set. We had to change our roadmaps. We never really had a roadmap, but with Unity deciding to adopt Zeitgeist, we are changing our roadmap to support Canonical and Ubuntu in direction they're going so we froze the features only one or two features are coming such as gps this is going to be awesome we'll be able to tell you according to your location which contacts or which files you'd like to use how, how would that be useful to a user when you're at work you mo most probably are not contacting your mom you're contacting other coll colleagues so when <laughs> when you're looking at your col uh, your contacts list it will uh, filter your contact list and show you when you're at home your the people you phone or, or exactly. email most at home and when you're at work your work or when you're or, or when you're at work you don't have access to your YouTube and Facebook stuff as a well you have access to them but they're going to not be really shown on the list because they don't have this high priority because you usually don't do that you're usually working on something on real work related stuff when you go home you're not working so you'll be watching movies etc and how is this integrated with Unity? What, what, what part does it play in Unity? Uh, most used recently, uh, so they're going to have uh, most used applications, which is was the simplest example. So the most used applications will always be displayed uh, and reordered dynamically. Um, then you're going to have a journal kind of view, which for your documents, will say it will say what things you use today. And today is sorted by recency. We, uh, this week is also sorted by recency and after everything else is sorted by frequency how much did you use that uh, document in that uh, in last month okay so it prioritizes stuff whether you've used it yeah the, the most recent documents and also if you've opened it a lot and it's like for example if you if you were crazy and had a, a document that was your to-do list you exactly. would be opening that all the time so that would be pushed up to the top of the exactly page. That's exactly how things are going to be working. And we did, we're, we did some other good things, but they're already in stable and trunk, but they won't be showing up for Unity because, yeah, they should start. I think they're still testing the platform. It's not 100% sure if they're going to use Zeitgeist. At least I think that is. And we have some nice things as an association. So I can tell you, when you use this document, you usually use this doc document with it too. And I dem demoed some things to people here at UDS showing them, yeah, I clicked through a playlist of files, a playlist in Rhythmbox, and then I asked for, I asked, told Psychus, give me all files related to a song, and it told me, okay, he saw, it, it, it took out some songs and said that they are related to the first song I was asking for, because they were played together in a playlist. It did not know about the playlist, but it did know that these songs happened to be played after each other frequently. Could it also relate different types of data? So, yeah, um, a certain document. You tend to edit a certain document while you're listening to a certain type of music, or the other way around. I'll when you're editing a certain type of document, you play a certain type of music. I'll take your example, and I'm even gonna raise it with one other one. We have a video, and it's on, on my blog, but I think I'll reblog it. That shows you which files do you usually most while contacting someone else. Okay, and what what scenario does that? When, I'm work when I chat with some of my Zeitgeist developers, I'm usually working on Zeitgeist files. It, it all sounds totally logical, and it makes you think that normal desktops where you, you actively go and find stuff that you think you need, um, when you hear about this, it, sound it seems kind of wrong. And yeah, you shouldn't be looking for the documents. I mean, the computer is your, should be your servant. It should be able to sh hand you anything you want. And I was... To be honest, I was, I'm kind of sick of the hierarchical file system. I mean, I try to keep myself organized. But to keep myself organized means I need a, a bigger hierarchy. I need, or I have to delete stuff from my computer, which I really don't like to. Does it ever get it wrong? Does it ever like play a ZZ Top song when it thinks you want you know, an ABBA song or something like that? Does it, does it 
does it does the heuristics or whatever it use um, well we Zeitgeist does not do it do anything for you as it doesn't play something for you it just suggests it su- suggests if you request the suggestion okay so it provides a, a list of things that you Ex- might exactly okay. so for example we're thinking of adding some support for the music store so if the user wants to have a better music experience he'll start pushing information about what songs did he listen to most in the last two days three days and having a set of these data we can then figure out something like last fm people who listen to these artists also listen to these artists and we're going to add this to the add this to the ubuntu music one store most probably we're still talking about it so the ubuntu music one store will adapt itself to the user who's actually tar- started trying to use it that's pretty cool and what um obviously here at uds we have a set of blueprints and a number of sessions yeah. for plans of what's going to go into Maverick. Are there any particular sessions while you've been here that have caught your eye? Any any sessions that, that involve Zeitgeist, obviously other than Unity, you know, but things you're interested in? Yeah, Social from Start, for example, where we were thinking of the example Gwibber. Gwibber is a very nice example where you write, cl- you, you have a lot of things coming in, as in tweets, and sometimes you want to know what was I doing or where were I at that point. So we have a demo actually right now, and I, I, if I had my network, I would have showed you, but it works. That I say, okay, when this happened, where, what, what was I doing? And it shows me the files I, I had open at that, at that point. Oh, so, so the same kind of thing when, well, from personal experience, when, when I've had a couple of drinks and I, something happens, I don't remember it until I've had a couple of drinks again. Yeah. But, I, and then that kind of memory kicks in. It can... <laughs> I'm not sure if this is the right analogy. <laughs> it is, it is. I had these issues before. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of links it links memories together in the same way yeah. the brain links one memory. Exactly. So these are things we have in trunk. They're working. We, we, we have plugins for Rhythmbox, for the Gnome Activity Journal that gives you suggestions. And we're trying to make the best out of it at the moment. But currently now, after... UDS and after a couple of sessions, we decide we have a we are starting to, we're going to start deploying more than we're actually going to try to improve the engine because the engine is stable enough for now, and we want to make sure that people who will use Unity and Ubuntu have the best experience, and we are more or less uh, now Ubuntu is our main focus as an upstream, and sadly to say I know this is going online but it's not GNOME anymore. We're really putting most of all our focus now on. On Ubuntu, we but as it's free software, other distributions. Can everyone can use it. Can everyone use it. can use it. But our main uh, upstream is still Launchpad. Is that mainly because Ubuntu has embraced what you've done and and they they've accepted what you've done, and realized the potential st- of it? I didn't know about it until I came here. Oh. I had no idea that this is going to be. I came here. I was surprised by Mark's talk. Oh, you were surprised about his announcement about I Unity. Did not, I did not know like. about anything. Oh. I just know one of my guys, uh, Mikel, our lead architect, works for Canonical now since March, and he didn't tell me. He didn't tell anyone, but that it's. I understand why, but it all makes sense now. That's fantastic news. It's it's amazing. I mean, from is it two years or so? No, it, it was tenth of October two thousand eight. My bedroom. <laughs> you remember those kind of events I remember you? this exact day because I was a bit sad and it was a Boston user the user hackfest user experience hackfest in Boston I couldn't go because of the visa issue so I, st- I saw Federico stuff online and I start. I just prototyped something very quickly put it online eight days later Federico Mena blogged about it and for me I was starstruck I mean Federico Mena said <laughs> for me it was something big and yeah and ever since it started going, but mostly I think the biggest biggest um, gain we had was UDS Barcelona, because after that we had I mean I was blessed with Siegfried Gifata, one of our like one of our main developers. He was a Google Summer of Code student, and now he's actually working as a maintainer for Zeitgeist on a on a, on an almost full time basis. And then after UDS we had Mikael Kamstrup, who is now the lead architect working at Canonical now and Marcus Kahn do, doing all the quality assurance all the uh, all the testing now even some really nice development and the team is just growing as in let's say 7-8 developers now it's good and we had more contributors we had people come and go but we have a set of developers that are steady now and 
So, so if anyone wants to find out more about Zeitgeist, where, what's the best place for them to go? Your blog or somewhere else? Where you would go? go to zeitgeistminusproject.com. Uh, you have most all the blogs. packages. For all packages are on Launchpad. We are hosted on. La- we are mainly hosted on Launchpad. So all development, all upstream happens on Launchpad. Thanks very much for talking to us. You're welcome. It's time for Gerald. Bit of Ubuntu. The ecosphere. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you know that yeah. Dell says Ubuntu is safer than Windows? No, they don't. <laughs> All right, they did. did <laughs> for they? a little while, for a few oh. days, and everyone went bonkers because they it actually specifically said, and I quote, Ubuntu is safer than Microsoft Windows. Who wow. wrote that? The Who vast majority that? of viruses and spyware written by hackers are not designed to target and attack Linux. Okay. Yeah, well, we knew that. Yeah. But your average Joe probably didn't know that. Yeah, fair enough. So what does it say now? Ubuntu is secure. According to industry reports, Ubuntu is unaffected by the vast majority of viruses and spyware. Hmm. Hmm. Subtly not quite as punchy. (laughs) (laughs) It's a shame, really. I like the way they kept the registered trademark symbols next to Microsoft and Windows, just to make sure they're actually, you know, know we're talking about the real thing. Yes. It's a shame, really, but, Hmm. you know... It's not really surprising, given given they are you know big partners with Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> You're not exactly going to trash someone who you know provides the operating system for the vast majority of your systems. But it's true. Well, there is that. <laughs> yeah. You can argue that it's no it's no more or less true the second statement than the first. It's still true. It's still true. Indeed, they should compromise their site and add it in. Did you also know? That 64-bit Ubuntu is not recommended. I heard this for daily desktop use. <laughs> That's what it says. Because <laughs> like no you can't idea. get flash for it. <laughs> I've no <laughs> idea. Actually, nobody knows. Well, there was a bug file. The background to this is, if you go to the new website that was released when Lucid came out, um, end of April, and you go through the download link, it says, you know, what do you want, desktop or server or whatever. And one of the options is 32-bit or 64-bit. And after 64-bit, it says not recommended for desktop use. And a few people went slightly, huh? <laughs> what? Why? And so bug number 585940 was filed. And there's been quite a lot of discussion and no real conclusion as to why exactly it says that. Really? It said that for a while, though, hasn't it? It, it said that since the new website was launched on yeah. the 29th of April. I, I thought it used to say something similar on the old version because I always assumed it was to make sure that people got something that would run on their computers. So 386 guaranteed to work, yeah. even on an old computer, 64-bit may not work. So you know, push people towards the thing that is going to work on their computer. But there's an argument where you could say if you know you've got a 64-bit machine, you know, if you've got mm. one of these CPUs you know, are recent within yeah. the last year. Yeah, at which know. point people go, I don't understand. Yeah, true for the vast majority of non-technical users. But how would you word it in a way that isn't, don't use this, don't use this. We'll ma- we make it, but don't use it. You can't use it. It's rubbish. It's a reasonable balance, because if somebody knows they want 64, but they can still click download on 64. They can, but the fact that it says not recommended brings sa- a slight alarm bells. Mm. Does that mean you yeah. don't support it? Does that mean I won't get security updates? What does that mean? Yeah. I, I, I agree there's some ambiguity. Means don't use it. We, we were talking about how um, biased we are, because we're all geeks, essentially. <gasps> We are. Uh, I mean, us, us three. Yeah. Uh, so not recommended is a good recommendation because it could spoil their Ubuntu experience. In what way? Well, things out of, out may the, not work. Out of the box, it's the same software, arguably. It's just compiled for 64-bit. But there will be things on there that don't work. Like? The big Fat Freddy Adobe thing. That's not on there. But no, but it will be. No, it's not on no, the no, CD. But, okay. I think it's... it's sh- yeah, but <laughs> Woo! You, you I got shushed. the. I got the. No, no, I was. I wasn't telling you to. Sh- <laughs> oh, <laughs> shut up! That would have been much more fun. Come back <laughs> after all camp and have a bit of a ruck <laughs> but in the garden. We haven't had a ruck for a long time. But that's another story. To me, if you spend an hour downloading an ISO and then you burn it to a CD or a USB stick or whatever, and you boot from it, and it turns out to be the wrong thing, and it just shows up strange characters, which is all the 64-bit does if you try to boot it on a 32-bit machine, that's quite a risk. And that's enough to justify some sort of cautionary message in my book. Yes, I agree, but not not, not recommended. Don't use this. Yeah, fair enough. So, if you have an opinion, you might want to have a look at bug number five eight five nine four zero. Join in, spout off, and be ignored. <laughs> <laughs> As part of uh, Google Summer of Code project, Andres Rodriguez is working on the front end for the command line tool Test Drive making it easier for people to try out development versions of Ubuntu in a virtual machine. 
Remind us what test drive is then. It's uh, a bit of Python. Mm -hmm. I think it was originally a Bash script, and it was written by Dustin Kirkland Mm -hmm. uh, of the server team at Canonical, and he rewrote it in Python, and it's basically a script that will go and get the ISO image for the latest development release of Ubuntu, and then automatically fire up a virtual machine. Uh, and run that ISO. So that could be KVM or VirtualBox. So if you want to get to grips with Maverick and try it out, you can use Test Drive. It'll get the latest version. Yep. Bob's your uncle. Yeah, you just on the command line, you just run it and press number one for the ISO and it gets it and starts it and done. Brilliant. So has it moved on since Test Drive originally came out? Does it send back any issues that it finds on the install or is it just a, a, a quick and easy way of installing the latest version? At the moment, yes, okay. it's a quick and easy way of getting the the ISO. But what uh, the Google Summer of Code project is all about is creating a graphical front end. Nice, Good which idea. is quite cute. Yeah, um, we talked about it a bit at UDS. There was a whole session around it, and we talked about the user interface. There's some screenshots on the uh, on the wiki of mockups and, and so on, and it's it's really getting there. And there was an announcement today that you can now get hold of it and try it out. Sweet. One of the things that has been growing in Ubuntu over the last few releases is the use of desktop couch, which is a sort of database data story thing that I don't really understand. But it's but it's um, used for synchronising things like Tomboy notes to Ubuntu One. Um, so you're able to synchronise your Tomboy uh, notes up to share them amongst multiple computers. Also, we've got Evolution, which does the same thing. It has a desktop couch interface, which allows you to synchronise your contacts to Ubuntu One, so it's in the cloud and all safe. And Firefox bookmarks can be done the same way using the Bindwood extension. And now you can do the same with Thunderbird 3. Oh, so you can, well, syn- you can do contacts. You can do your contacts. You can synchronise your contacts up to the cloud. So one of the things that they uh, they mentioned in their little press release they sent us about this is that it's a good way for people to migrate from Evolution to Thunderbird 3. That's interesting. Or presumably vice versa, but they didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. There's a few people who don't really like Evolution. And they would appreciate the ability to move to Thunderbird 3. I, I must admit, I've been trying Thunderbird 3 since I've upgraded my laptops uh, to the latest Lucid. Do you use a fat desktop client? How yeah, quaint. I know. I also have webmail as well, but oh. I, I use Thunderbird 3 and it's been so slow. Mainly because it's got this big indexing thing. It's, it's introduced lots of Google type search, contextualized search, which means it downloads every single email and archives it. So if you have Thunderbird 3 on one machine, it does it there. And then if you have it on another machine, it read downloads and reindexes the whole thing there as well, and it's hugely you should, you time consuming. Think about putting all your email in the cloud and let someone else index yeah. it for you. <laughs> Absolutely, you could probably even pay them to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll keep. But it no, it sounds. I I do worry about this reliance on desktop couch because it's not mm. supremely reliable. And I know I'm going to get the wrath of Stuart Language there, but it's all right. We can we can cope with that. Yeah, I'm, I live far enough away from it. No, that's okay. But things like Gwibber synchronizes stuff oh, right. up to desktop couch which seems massively pointless and also causes a huge dependency on desktop couch for Gwibber and Gwibber right. seems incredibly unstable as a result I must admit my Ubuntu One experience hasn't been great either I'm not in what way? well we, we've used it to try and share some of the podcast files yeah. around and, and it sort of sits it's there bit, and doesn't do anything. it's a bit flaky I've got to say I know they've had server problems I actually sat down with um, Elliot Murphy at UDS unfortunately I couldn't get any of this on record (laughs) Uh, so you'll have to take with a pinch of salt everything I say but um, he described (laughs) (laughs) he said it was all going to (laughs) work no he explained how they're having massive scaling issues because they've got so many people so many more people using it and he detailed the vast number of uh, files that people are syncing and huge amounts of um, music that people are downloading and um, that's good and all that's using the ubuntu one infrastructure and that's causing a problem they're having to put lots more hardware in place wow. and carve the database up and spread it across all that all that hardware in order to uh, in order to alleviate the load I'll, so i look forward to going back to using it of course right now dropbox for the win but it works, i mean ubuntu one eventually victim yeah. of its own success perhaps well, that's a well good certainly from what elliot was saying about the number of people who are using it and the volume of data and the number of uh, purchases from the music store. It, Ubuntu One does seem to be doing well. Mm. If Desktop Couch can keep up with that, I, I understand that Canonical are talking to the Desktop Couch people a lot and feeding back their performance tuning measures because this is probably the biggest Desktop Couch implementation yeah, anyone's mm-hmm. done. Yeah, which you know it's a good thing. Good you stuff. know, it's going to improve upstream as well. So those people who say Canonical don't uh, don't uh, <laughs> contribute to upstream can you know. 
believe no that. <laughs> yeah, believe my third hand information from someone. Okay, Operation Clean Sweep. Um, I should be involved in this, but I'm not. I've been slacking. Anyway, Operation Clean Sweep is an activity to clean up all the bugs with patches before Maverick is released. The launch got delayed due to operational problems and real life, but eventually the reviewers team was able to announce the launch on June the 4th, 2010. The plan is to encourage folks to review one patch a day. With a target of fixed 15 patches per day, it doesn't seem uh, big. At the launch date, uh, there were 1,952 in the re- review queue. As of now, there are 1,797 in the review queue. Clearly, there is an enthusiastic uh, participation. The number isn't written in stone, and we get at least one new patch every day. It's very essential that we get uh, community participation to help clean our distro and also upstream, since our goal is to first send patches to the upstream authors since they have a good idea about their software and how it works and their blueprint for the future of the software. So we have loads and loads of bugs on Launchpad, and some of them actually have patches on them. But nobody looks at them. But often... Nobody has the time to look at them, and that's what this clean sweep is about. People are not just finding bugs that say this is broken, but this is broken and here's a fix. Do you know? And that's great. Patching, when the patch is there, is really quick and really easy. So I'll take a you know, dig in the ribs for not joining in. It is. It's really easy. It, it takes half an hour. Do you think this bug. sort of scheme will take attention away from other bug fixing things, though? Well paper cuts or something like that Mm, i don't think so because the the idea behind this is to have lots of different initiatives that people can get involved in like Mm. someone who gets involved in a paper cut um might be more inclined to be creating a patch the the idea behind paper cuts being you know they're very simple easily easily resolvable problems that that cause a gripe for a large number of users it might be that someone can create a quick and easy patch Mm -hmm. and get that done you know very easily whereas the idea of clean sweep is we've got this historical baggage of patches that we need to sort out so i think there's two different goals there and i probably different people would be using yeah, we'll you, be in those you don't teams. have to be particularly switched on, as I've proved, to be able to apply <laughs> patches. No, seriously. Oh, great. Yeah. You so, too can. So how, how low is the bar? Uh, yeah. It's pretty low, which is why I've helped out. So you know, you can leave the um, you know, the experts to process it once you've applied a patch. So have a go. That's the thing. Plus, it's passing patches upstream, as we say. Mm. You know, those who say that Ubuntu doesn't give anything. Oh, you said that before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Time for your feedback. We've got a lot since we were last here. I don't think we're going to get through it all, though, are we? Fortunately, we've had. We've <laughs> Did had. I to say, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> let's not. People have taken back. the time to leave comments. We should read them out. We have cherry picked some. Okay. So let's start with Matt McGraw. Greetings again from Northern California. I listen to you on my portable Samsung P2 as I go about my daily walk and housework. And you all keep me laughing. I must look a total idiot laughing myself, but I love the humour you uh, bring to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, to be fair, uh, we look like total idiots when we were recording it. Yeah. So it's and most of it isn't intentional, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> it just kind of happens that way. Yeah. Sean from Leicestershire in the UK writes... I'm just emailing you to say I think your podcast is the best Linux podcast out there. Oh, wow. I look forward to each new show that informs me of all the latest news. I'm a new Ubuntu user and have just updated to 10.04. It's quite good. The one problem I do have, though, is I still can't get my iPod Touch to work, even though it's supposed to. Oh, dear. That's that new comment about Apple, but I won't. What's this new Lib Mobile device thing that's supposed to make it work? but perhaps it doesn't. So if you've got any experience with iPod Touches on Ubuntu and perhaps have solved some problems with it, why don't you email in and we can uh, read them out on the next show. Hmm. Or Sean could file a bug against Lib Mobile Device, which is the library that makes it all work. Yeah. Or Rhythmbox or help whatever application he's trying to connect. Sounds like a good idea. Phil Thompson wrote in and said, Did you spot that Nick and Dave's wedding vows include references to open source? Who? Nick Clegg. And David Cameron. Oh, I see. We will create a level playing field for open source software and will enable large ICT projects to be split into smaller components. We will ensure that all data published by public bodies is published in an open and standardised format so that it can be used easily with minimal cost by third parties. Even planning is looking to open source for its methodology. In the longer term, we will radically reform the planning system to give neighbourhoods far more ability to determine the shape of the places 
in which their ha- inhabitants live, based on the principles set out in the Conservative Party publication Open Source Planning. Wow. It's like crowdsourced planning, then. I didn't actually re- read any of this. I don't know. Well, it's, the data thing's particularly interesting, because one of the things that the current government systems do is they publish a lot of data, but it's all in PDFs. So the Guardian, for example, have a, a crowdsourcing effort to extract the data from those PDFs and get it into something that they can... Uh, um, oh, they use Google Documents to yeah. do that. Yeah, sometimes it's crowdsourced and sometimes it's um, uh, it's sort of me- mechanised in some way. But, um, yeah, to get all the actual data into usable form is, is, is yeah. a bit of effort at the moment. So hopefully it'll be a CSV or something in the future. Mm. I just hope they don't interpret open and standardised format to be Word document and Excel spreadsheet because yeah. that's the standard. I think they're a little bit savvier than that, though. I hope so. <laughs> and I'm hoping they're not just seeing it as the cheap option in terms of open source. Mm. Uh, obviously, you've got to cut costs and save money everywhere, but open source isn't necessarily just the cheaper way to do it. It's got other things going for it as well. Mm. Ian Pascoe said, On the podcast website, where you have the various download links, could you please annotate the accessibility label on them to say which download they refer to? Using my screen reader, when I tab through the list to get to the podcast I want to play, all I hear is download. And I have to uh, guess which one is the one I want. Ah, yes. Yes, Web Monkey, sort it out. Yes. Uh, well, is it possible? I always put them in the same order, actually. The first one is always OG high, then OG low, then MP3 high, then MP3 low. So that does help a little bit. A little, but... Yes, we should make it more accessible, and um, I'll certainly have a go at that. I don't know whether it's it's the bit that PodPress generates, so I don't know how possible it is to put that data in there. But it's I all just, it's all code. It's all code, <laughs> right? Okay, it's so, a simple matter of programming. Right, fair enough. Thanks for the pointer in, and uh, we'll hand that to Dave because he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I felt quite impressed. I'm, the box that runs our uh, podcast, <clears throat> which is a VPS provided by Bitfolk, we upgraded to Lucid. Uh, last week, oh, yes. this week you did it, it, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I just followed the guide, do release upgrade. I had a couple of issues, and there's a couple of bugs already filed about those. So, nice. yeah, and they're not fixed yet. So uh, there we go. Mm-hmm. And had a problem with WordPress and fixed that. So yeah, it went fairly smoothly. So yeah, if we can, um, yeah, now I'm on a bit of a mission to get the website working well. Then yeah, I'll have a go at that. Cool. Chris Gilt Nain wrote in. I've just brought my three-year-old son a laptop as he loves the games and puzzles that come in the Ubuntu package, but I can't find any way of easily setting up parental control on this laptop. And by easily, I mean software center and GUI-based, not obscure command line love on IT, IP tables and GCONF settings. This isn't a huge problem yet, but as Ubuntu is aiming to get more and more mainstream, there seems to be a hole here. Parents like me who want to bring up their kids to understand there is more to computer life than Microsoft need something to to prevent their kids seeing some of the darker sides of the internet, at least for a few years yet. There's a massive can of worms. Yeah. All the uh, articles and things that I've seen that suggest how you can set up parental controls are all pretty command line love and and, um, not quite IP tables and stuff, but, you know, setting up proxy servers and Dan's Guardian and things like that. I was thinking one step back from that and whether you block... You know that that, that <laughs> right. can of worms. I I asked okay. a similar question on my on my blog about a month or so ago when I asked um, how should I set up email for my daughter and oh, yeah. what about parental controls oh, yeah. and yeah, there yeah. were loads of comments. People telling me that I shouldn't let my daughter anywhere near the internet. Other people telling me the other extreme that um, you should let your daughter have full access to the internet and not restrict what she can see. You know, so there's a lot of schools of thought about what the best way. Yeah, to do so it is. You two have both got kids of different ages, so mm-hmm. Alan, yours are younger, so what do you do? do you, will you filter at some point? At the moment, they both uh, sadly use a Mac. They don't use right. Ubuntu, and th- I use the parental controls. I I set it up without really thinking, hmm. and I set up the parental controls to set their homepage to uh, CBBs, which they tend to like, and also I manually add in additional um, So to a whitelist base? Yes. Okay. What about you, Simon? Mine are both teenagers. One's almost not a t- teenager, so wow. they, um, they have full access. Okay. You know, it's down to how you bring your kids up is the way I do it. Yeah. It's a tricky one. So so uh, assuming that some control is required by some people, then something like Dan's Guardian? I know I know the Ubuntu Christian edition had has a, it by default, a nice yeah. graphical thing for controlling Dan's yeah, okay. Guardian, and it seemed pretty good, actually. It's the one thing that, when people review the Christian edition, it's the one thing people focus on, is it has quite good parental controls built in. Mm. And it is apps like Dan's Guardian, I think. Okay. Well, it might be worth a look, at least, to see if there's uh, something in there that you could use in the future. Well, all the stuff's in the repository, so 
Uh, it's oh, just yes. it's just in there by default. On so it's almost as if we, I hate to say it, need a, another distro that where this stuff is, is set up easily by a parent on you know child's laptop. Or even just a, a nice guide. Someone should yeah. just create a nice mm-hmm. guide that says how you do it for parents with loads of screenshots, sure. graphical apps, mm-hmm. not, you know, like he says, command line foo. I think Edge Ubuntu had a filtering proxy server built into it as well by default. Oh, right. So, I mean, that's a similar kind of market, I guess. What's the other one called? The one there's Squid Guard, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, there's a few other there, and there are obviously lots of commercial ones as well, but they don't necessarily run on, on Linux. A lot of people like to sit, have them sit, sat outside of the computer, so between, you're essentially on your firewall or something, between the computer yes. and the network connection, so you, it's managed centrally. But no ideal, is it? No. I'd be interested to know what people do. Mm. Um, in fact, on any platform, whether it's mm. Windows, Linux or Mac, I'd, I'd be interested to know how, how people control what people on their network you know, do. Yeah. Whether that's at home or you know a small club or something like that, similar kind of requirements, I guess. Well, just write in and let yeah, us know. Let us know. Yeah. And that's all your feedback. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, mm-hmm. including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Yes, and all the other palaver and stuff. It's uh, getting a bit dark now. It is. I'm starting to get cold. Maybe we should fire the barbecue. Hmm. Maybe you should just go home. <laughs> Get out of my house. Well, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily in your house. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.